Happy Christmas, Dermot. Happy Christmas, Richard. As we come to the end of this century and, about to, and we are about to go into the new century, I thought you might be interested in a little bit of history. I put together a few of the film clips of the development of the airport, and these go back to some 20 years ago. So enjoy them and compare how splendidly the airport is doing now. All best wishes for Christmas and a happy new year. to mend their burst water mains, were they striking a blow for freedom or were they asking for trouble, perhaps even endangering life? Well, that's an argument we're going to try to resolve out of court, as it were, tonight with the mas former master of the roles, Lord Denning, and the scientific director of the Thames Water Authority, Dr Michael Dart. We also discover why London businessmen have taken to Chinese folk songs. At first, a dogfight in the skies over London. As the inquiry into plans for a third airport goes on and on, today was the 196th day of the hearings. Plans for a fourth airport in the Docklands, just six miles from St Paul's Cathedral, are actually well advanced. But as Peter Prendergast has been finding out, the plans aren't likely to get through without a real battle. That plane was landing at Plymouth Airport. But what's upsetting these people in the Three Crowns in North Woolwich is that tomorrow it could be landing in Docklands. Let a man speak. You Let a man speak. Speak. I'm talking point. about North Woolwich. This is North Woolwich. In fact, a plane did land in the West India docks last summer. But that was only a trial run. The actual proposal is for something more permanent, a so-called Skull Port, an airport for short takeoff and landing aircraft, six miles east of the city in the Royal Docks. The people behind the scheme are the construction company Molum and a small West Country airline called Bryman Airways. The city businessman in London has the choice at this moment in time of travelling by surface transport to either Heathrow or Gatwick. Uh, that can take anything up to an hour, an hour and a quarter. Uh, the alternative choice that we think he will be tempted to take will be simply to get into a taxi or the local transport, travel 10 to 15 minutes to the east, and there he will have what we believe will be a very pleasant airport, a very simple airport. Bryman know all about stall ports and stall aircraft. They've turned their headquarters here in Plymouth from the equivalent of a one-horse town with a grass runway, a couple of porter cabins, and a handful of staff and passengers 10 years ago into a thriving operation, handing over 130,000 passengers a year, a staff of nearly 100, and with all the support and ground facilities of a normal-sized airport. 11.45 from Plymouth. Yes. The advantage of Stalports is that check-in times are so much shorter. For the flight from Heathrow, Bryman asked us to check in 45 minutes before the flight. The check-in time here at Plymouth is 15 minutes. Yeah. And every day of the week it's 17, 13, 18, 45 too. The key to the Stalport is this Canadian-built aircraft, the de Havilland Dash 7. Its great advantage is that it can take off and land in literally half the distance of a normal aircraft. This is what makes it possible to build airports so close in to city centres. This one's only four miles from the centre of Plymouth. The Dash carries 50 passengers and has a range of about 400 miles. This means it can reach most airports in this country and many of the main ones in Europe. Its top speed may be only half that of a conventional jet, 
but on a short flight, the journey time is virtually the same. But would anyone use an airport on the east side of London? We asked passengers on a flight from Heathrow to Plymouth. Um, I'm an engineer. I commute quite regularly to Cornwall, perhaps a dozen times a year. I work in the city normally and live in South East London. So, um, yeah, an airport in East London would be very useful. It would save me the time it takes to get from central London to Heathrow. Under those circumstances, I would say anything like an hour, hour and a quarter. And for me, uh, as you asked, the uh, airport east of London would be very convenient if uh, my most business on, is on the south coast of uh, England. To make the 20 mile journey to Heathrow normally takes about an hour. How would a journey to the Stallport compare? We're going to see now exactly how long it does take us to get from here, right in the middle of the city, to the site of the proposed airport in the Docklands. The time is now 3.28. Let's go. The only feasible way to get to the site of the proposed airport at the moment is by road. The airport itself will provide minibuses, stallmobiles, to ferry passengers to and from the city. The stallmobiles will also serve as mobile check-in points. But although the site is only six miles from the centre of the city as the crow flies, the traffic can be heavy. The only rail link into Dockland at the moment is via the North Woolwich line, but the nearest that gets to the city is Islington. London Transport plan to build a rail link from Tower Hill into the Isle of Dogs with a possible extension to the Royal Docks, but that won't be ready until 1987. Well, we're here, and it's four o'clock, so it's taken us exactly 32 minutes. Well, that's about half an hour quicker than Heathrow. But London already has two of the world's busiest airports on its doorstep. Heathrow, with 26.5 million passengers at the moment, and set to rise to 38 million by 1990, if the third London airport inquiry now going on gives them the go-ahead for a fifth terminal. And Gatwick, with over 11 million passengers now, but set to rise to 20 million by 1990. Stansted and Essex has only 300,000 passengers at the moment, but that could rocket to 15 million if the airport inquiry gives them the go-ahead to expand. Despite all this, the backers of Stolport hope it will be getting a fair share of that market with 1 million passengers by 1990. Bryman have already applied to the Civil Aviation Authority for routes to Manchester, Plymouth and the Channel Islands in this country, and Paris, Brussels, Rotterdam, Amsterdam and Frankfurt in Europe. Dockland today is all about idle cranes, laid up ships and disused warehouses. 4,000 acres of virtual wasteland. So there's no shortage of room for an airport. A cargo of scrap metal destined for India for conversion into bicycles. This will be the last ship to be loaded in the Royal Docks. It's into this picturesque but redundant fossil of a bygone era that Molum want to pump six million pounds worth of new blood. The airport itself will cover about 90 acres in all. The runway will be the central pier that runs between the Albert and King George V docks. The man who saw the possibilities of turning water into wings and money was Molum's chairman, Philip Beck. But it will provide a service to people living on the east side of London, uh, which they haven't had before, and people from the city of as well. Uh, and we believe in that sense it will provide a real benefit to the local, uh, uh, to, the, to the east London community. You're not no, the only one no, no, but some of Mr Beck's East London community are somewhat less convinced of the benefits to them of an East London airport as opposed to the city businessmen. The local protest group campaign against the airport claim the airport would be noisy, dangerous and would provide few jobs. 
A Murray poll commissioned by the London Docklands Development Corporation, however, found that over 50% of local people were in favour of an airport, 22% against, and 25% don't knows. But noise ranked top of the list of people's worries. So we took the GLC's noise expert, John Simpson, to Plymouth to see just how noisy it was. Mr. Simpson, that sounded rather quiet to me. What did your machines tell you? Well, the peak noise level was about 86 decibels, which is quite quiet. It's a quiet aircraft of its type. It's difficult to say under these weather conditions exactly what sort of noise levels we would experience under good conditions. You can see the way the aircraft was moving about in the air, and the wind does affect the noise recordings that we have. Again. Should we try and take it again? Yes, I think we could. Now, how did that noise? Well, that gives you some idea of the variation. That noise was nearly five decibels higher. So, um, maybe if we did a hundred runs, we get a good average of the noise level that, that might. Um, come at the airport in Docklands. The GLC have in fact worked out what sort of effect the noise would have on the people of Docklands if there were that many runs a day, and what percentage of them would become annoyed by it. The Drew Road Primary School, the large building, is only about 500 yards from the proposed runway, and together with 31 other buildings would be in the area worst affected by noise. The GLC reckon that 35% of the inhabitants would be annoyed by the noise. As the plane got further away, another 578 buildings plus two more primary schools would hear the noise, but the percentage of people actually annoyed by it would drop to 25. That estate of new houses would come on the fringe of the noise-affected area, as would 3,000 or so other buildings, including four more schools and a hospital. But again, the number of people actually annoyed by the noise would drop to 15%. People in the tower blocks wouldn't be affected by the noise, but local people are worried about the safety of an airport surrounded by tall buildings. This airport uh, will make considerably less noise nuisance than any airport that's been seen in this country before. Uh, the noise contours here are tiny compared to Heathrow. The same noise contour here, which will cover only the Royal Docks, uh, in the case of Heathrow, stretches from roughly Richmond to Windsor. But in an area that's lost 9,000 of the 10,000 jobs it had almost 10 years ago, Molam know that the best way to win friends and influence people is to promise jobs. Their offer, 5,000 as spin-offs from the airport, 490, three-quarters of them local, with the airport itself. There are a lot of jobs on the airport which can be done by local people. In fact, the majority of them, the numbers that will require uh, people with very long training, uh, such as pilots and uh, radio mechanics, are relatively few. With the large numbers will be involved in baggage handling, in fireman's work, in uh, um, um, all sorts of jobs are in the airport, check-in, uh, uh, on the check-in desks and so on. But the GLC, who are opposed to the airport, reckon they can top Molam's offer. We believe that we can provide square foot for square foot more jobs than the uh, Stalport development can. We can do that by retaining some cargo handling, by expanding work and distribution, and by building new factory units. And that's the way in which we believe we can do it. In an area where the symbols of redundancy are so stark, the main argument is bound to be about jobs. But people's emotions are stirred by more basic things. Well, I myself, I'm afraid, have only just moved here. The reason I moved here was it was such a lovely, peaceful place to live in London. That was the, the only reason I moved here is because I could actually find peace. Now, number one, employment. I cannot see that the airport is going to give any employment for local people apart from menial cleaning jobs. Everything else is going to be imported. It's technical, it's skilled jobs. There's not going to be any employment from that. These people may not possess the traditional weapons of the airport protester, the green fields, the historic monuments, the thatched cottages. But in their docks, they reckon they have a way of life equally worth fighting for against the airport lobby and equally worth shouting about.
Woodby building with the lawyers and the rest of it is a bus stop for the rich. It's not a matter of if you're in your house you don't hear it. It's a matter of the dangers involved if you think about I'm it. Dangerous. And it's frightening you already right. you to could think. Walk out, get bloody <laughs> Transfer 04 is clear to price Charles de Gaulle on a hasty well uniform departure to Squawk 05 at 17. Charles de Gaulle on a hasty well uniform departure 0517 at Squawk and uh, Stars 04. London City Airport, the solution to an international businessman's problem. Six miles from the city, counterparts in Paris, Amsterdam and Brussels are a little more than an hour away, door to door. of this high-flying glamour, not everyone is a fan of the airport. You get their dirt and dust, their fumes. We get nothing but aggro, and when they're taxiing there, and weekends, don't, they'll tell you they don't land other planes. Now, they landed some the other Sunday. When we went down there, they made out that we didn't know what we were on about. We're sitting here watching them, listening to them. I mean, in them houses down there, some weekends we can't sit in our back gardens because the noise drives you mad. It is possible that this airport might not survive without the Whisper Jet. I wouldn't put it any more strongly than that. It is possible, but we, we are not prejudging that issue until we have got to that point and we know what the economic climate is and so many other factors which will come into play, which we can't foresee now. London City Airport is in trouble. Originally conceived of as an airport to serve nearby European capitals, it must now expand and fly jets or it could face closure. But a noisy group of local protesters is campaigning to block any use of jets. They say the airport has already ruined the quality of their lives and that larger planes would only make things worse. In five weeks' time, a public inquiry will decide whether or not to allow London City Airport to extend its runway and go ahead with its plans. Tonight in the London programme, we ask why the airport has failed to meet its aims and examine the David and Goliath battle between London City Airport and its neighbours. London City Airport was the idea of Sir Philip Beck, chairman of the Molem building firm and a keen amateur pilot. With 1992 round the corner, Sir Philip's target market was to be the business commuter travelling to the financial centres of Northern Europe. When the idea was born in 1981, it seemed that here was a venture which would underline London's position as the financial capital of the world and create jobs in the deprived Docklands. The first airport to be built in Britain for 40 years, it was funded with private capital. Because the area was surrounded by high-rise buildings, it was to be a stall port for short takeoff and landing propeller-driven aircraft. Well, we were regarded as a milestone in aviation history. People have been advocating for the last 10, 15 years that such things should happen, but nobody had been able to make it happen before. There were no suitable sites in most cities. In response to local fears and GLC pressure, a public inquiry was held but Molem swayed the inspectors when they demonstrated that the plane they had in mind, a Dash 7 short takeoff and landing aircraft built by de Havilland of Canada, was no noisier than a car passing a window at 30 miles an hour. It also presented an opinion poll that showed over half the local people were in favour of the airport, with the rest evenly divided between being neutral and opposed. Molem got the go-ahead, but were restricted to 120 flights per day. The runway length was also restricted, thereby determining the type of plane which could use the airport. The airport opened to a fanfare of publicity in October 1987, but since then a number of factors have conspired to thwart Molem's ambitions. It's done less well than it expected. 
essentially the owners saw a period of two years in which they'd have to build up their business. But they saw themselves hitting the target throughput to break even after three years of operation, getting 400,000 passengers a year. In the event, as we know, they only achieved 100,000 passengers in their first year of operations, 200,000 in the second year, and now they're starting to build up to over 300,000. Problems that Molam could never have foreseen struck damaging blows even before the airport's grand opening. First, the financial world suffered a crisis which was to reduce potential passenger numbers. The week before the airport opened uh, was Black Monday, uh, in which the, the stock market crash occurred. Um, and uh, I think that um, the airport itself has, has suffered from that. There isn't the uh, amount of money around that there was. Interest rates have uh, increased subsequently. So uh, the airport's target market has not, not grown as uh, they originally hoped. Four weeks later, an air traffic control scare put a temporary halt on the busy Paris route. The boast that a businessman could reach the airport from the Bank of England in 20 minutes soon proved to be hollow. Roadworks, which it was hoped would improve links to the airport, have in fact snarled up traffic. Improvements to local transport links have taken longer than expected. The Docklands Light Railway will one day go within a few minutes walk of the airport terminal, but it's unlikely to be completed until December 1992. The surface access um, is not as good as it might be. The airport uh, um, builds itself on its ability to uh, be able to process the passenger very quickly, but the, uh, the A13 is uh, particularly congested and uh, access to the airport is taking uh, people from the city 40 minutes or so, which is only slightly better than, it, than the time it takes to, uh, to go to Heathrow. Well, certainly the infrastructure in Docklands is a disaster. Um, essentially, it was a, uh, an enterprise zone that uh, went off half cock. Uh, if you go to the La Defense in Paris, plenty of infrastructure, RER there. If you go to Docklands, you've got a, a toy town railway, basically. The main problem is the lack of public transport. I mean, it's, it's a three or four hundred yard walk to a British rail station where the service has in the past been abysmal. Um, well, I'm not flying back in until eight, so I'll miss all the traffic going back because that's the only problem. Like this morning, I had to leave uh, quite a bit earlier purely to get through the Blackwall Tunnel. The lack of awareness of the airport and poor access have damaged the competitive edge it should have over its rivals. And aviation experts believe it means businessmen prefer to travel from their homes in the suburbs to other airports. I travel quite a lot. I use Gatwick because it's easier to go straight from home, straight into Gatwick, rather than go all the way into town to use London City. I think there are few businessmen who actually live in the city who get up in the morning and say, I've got to go to Paris, therefore I'll use London City. I think they've got that problem. They take a lot of incoming traffic from uh, say Paris for instance, who come straight into the city and could go straight from city airport into town, do their business, straight back out again, no hassles, it's great for that. But as for the British businessman, I think a lot of people tend to do what I do and use Heathrow and Gatwick because they live out of town. Airports make money by charging airlines a fee per passenger and per landing, so low passenger figures mean low profits. A reflection of this was Molem's announcement earlier this year that they had written off three and a half million pounds of their own profits. And in March this year, London City Airlines, which operates from the airport, closed its Amsterdam route and shed 40 jobs. But perhaps the biggest blow was the unexpected news that the Dash 7 would cease production. Small enough for airports with limited space, yet big enough to carry a profitable passenger load, the airport was designed around the Dash 7. Well, shortly after the airport opened, uh, de Havilland of Canada, who manufacture the Dash 7, announced that uh, they were no longer going to produce it. Um, that means that the airport does not have a, a long-term future um, in terms of the aircraft that can be operated there at, at the moment. Um, the Dash 7 will be, uh, will be flying around for the next 15, 20 years. There's no problem, at least up until the year 2010, 
but um, long term permission has to be granted for other aircraft types to use the airport. Molam saw the Dash 7 as a long-term prospect. They were shocked to discover it would cease production and therefore could only be regarded as a short-term proposition for the airport. There is no possible way in which we can know the decision taking, the decision process of an aircraft manufacturer in America. And the company that had been building the Dash 7 was effectively sold and acquired by Boeing, who have their own particular plans. Molam are keen to point out the long-term nature of their investment, but the end of the Dash 7 would seem to threaten the airport's future. We have never said, and nobody should have expected, that a project like this would be instantaneously viable. Uh, no worthwhile major investment can ever be in the first two or three years. You have only to look at Gatwick as the classic example of that, which was still, by some people, deemed to be a white elephant after about five years. So we're, we're doing nicely. We're not yet profitable and we make no bones about that. The airport reached a difficult stage. It had hoped to offer more jobs, but already 40 have been lost. It was granted 120 flights a day, but uses just about 50. It had hoped to attract half a million passengers this year, but it's on course for only 300,000. In the short term, the difficulties of access by road and rail mean that MOLA must continue to underwrite losses. In the long term, that is within 15 years or so, the lifespan of the Dash 7, a successor aircraft must be found. The British Aerospace 146 jet is seen as the solution to both of these problems. The British Aerospace 146, the so-called Whisper Jet, is the plane Molum favours to solve its problems. It has double the flying range and double the seating capacity. With the 146, we can reach places like Lisbon and Madrid and Milan, Vienna, Warsaw, Stockholm, that sort of range. So all of Europe is brought within the range of London City Airport. And we believe that's the kind of thing that we should be looking for as a, as, as a future for this airport. Because we'll be able to offer our passengers exactly the same benefits. Um, ten minute check-in, fast arrival, and an airport with no stress, but to many more destinations in Europe, that'll make the place inevitably much more successful. Two years ago, the airport staged a landing of the British Aerospace 146 to demonstrate to local people that the Whisper Jet lived up to its name. But to land and take off safely with a full payload, the jet needs an extra 169 meters of runway. And it's that which has caused the second public inquiry. Jointly held by the Department of Transport and Environment, it's due to start on July the 6th and will consider Molam's application. The inquiry is legally obliged to weigh the airport's needs against the feelings of the local community. Although they're in the minority, the protesters believe that they have evidence which will sway the inspectors and get the application vetoed. The inquiry will consider the effect of the airport's expansion on factors like noise, future planning, safety, and character of the area. It'll hear evidence from local people and businesses. Just as Molam made a mistake in choosing the Dash 7, protesters believe jets may not be the right choice for the airport or the area. Their two main objections are on the grounds of noise and safety. I mean, everybody's on about noise. They don't see the other aggro or early morning taxiing and practising weekends of them planes where you've got to get up. Where we are now is very quiet. But when a plane's in and out and you're about a mile down that road near that terminal, it's absolutely deafening. The protesters claim a large groundswell of support. They've been doing their research on aviation since the first public inquiry. They believe the angle at which the jets would land and take off, known as the glide slope factor, would be dangerous to both passengers and those living beneath the flight path. The glide slope is the angle between the ground and the airplane's flight path. The Dash 7 lands and takes off at a steep angle of seven and a half degrees. The British Aerospace 146 jet would land and take off on a lesser angle of five and a half degrees. But protesters believe the jets are not built to fly at this angle and would pass dangerously close to buildings. When you come to a five and a half degree coming in at that angle, it's not very good either for the passenger 
or for the people on the ground because then they've got to slew up like that and that's exactly what these planes do. And now, I mean, these planes here, they're coming in at a seven and a half degree slope. If you take a, an angle like that, it, it surely is very hairy to be able to uh, sit in a plane and coming down, it's like being on the back of a switchback, really. The BA-146 is going to come on, on a 5.5 degree slope, which is not a very good angle for any jet to come in at all. Um, because it's never been practiced anywhere, never been practiced. We had one, one demonstration of an empty plane. So, I mean, I think myself that is a, a very big safety hazard. Protesters also say the jets could be dangerously disabled if a bird is sucked into the engines. Yes, there's a possibility of a bird strike being more prevalent if the jets come in. Here I would have said that the danger was worse because the whole area is surrounded by water and there's lots of waterfowl about. And, I mean, you, you will see ducks coming in droves, not necessarily landing here, but they do come in to go over to the reservoirs. And there is the, there is the definite possibility of a bird strike. And if that gets into, ingested into one engine of the uh, jet, that leaves one engine to fly on. Technical observations like these have to be taken seriously. And despite the protesters' lack of numbers, they could count heavily against the airport's application. But the London programme has found that there are serious flaws in their arguments. While most large planes, like jumbos, fly in at a glide slope factor of three degrees, the 146 manual advises pilots the aircraft can cope perfectly well on the steeper slope of six degrees. This is endorsed by the Civil Aviation Authority, the arbiter of aviation safety standards. Also, recently, the Swiss airline Crossair did a test flight into Lugano in Switzerland, with a 146 using a six and a half degree glide slope. They don't know what they're talking about. It's perfectly safe. They operate, Danair operate into Innsbruck using a four and a half degree glide slope. Uh, London City, they'll only need a five and a half degree glide slope. It's been certificated in instrument and visual conditions by the Civil Aviation Authority up to six degrees. It's perfectly safe. Most aeroplanes come down at a three degree glide path. Uh, the 146 has been certificated up to six degrees, but it's still slow it's like if you like going downhill on a bike you put the brakes on so you're not going any faster the steeper the hill on the question of the 146's noise levels tests show that the dash 7 has a taxiing level of 72 decibels while the british aerospace 146 taxis at 66 decibels on takeoff, while the Dash 7 has a sound level of 75 decibels, the 146 is 85 decibels. Overhead, both planes register 70 decibels. On landing, both planes register 80 decibels. What this means is that only on takeoff is the 146 noisier. With a maximum sound level of 85 decibels, Experts liken the level to hearing average traffic from the curbside. At the John Wayne Airport in Orange County, California, acknowledged by many experts as having some of the most stringent noise controls in the world, the 146 has been passed for takeoff and landing. In Manchester Airport, the authorities there do not include the 146 in its strictly limited night flying quota because its sound is considered negligible. Well, 146 is a very quiet aeroplane. It's been accepted in a number of airports around the world as being the quietest in its class in the United States. Uh, Manchester has voted to leave it out of its night quota of aeroplanes because it's so quiet. The possibility of an engine ingesting a bird during takeoff and landing is no more likely at city airports than any other. The CAA estimates the incidence of accident due to bird strike as a probability factor of 33,000 to one. At the city airport, they're required by law to employ bird scaring measures around the runway. I think what they're talking about is ingestion of a bird into an engine. Uh, this aircraft has got four engines. It's got four engine safety. Uh, again, it's certificated to accept birds up to a certain strength. And after all, the birds don't know the difference between one aeroplane and another. The bird strike problem is there for the propeller-driven aeroplanes also. 
People in this area have lived with noise and pollution all their lives. Busy docks once stood on this site, and most people here agree that they were far noisier than the airport is. A recent Mori poll taken after the Whisper Jet tests lent weight to this view. It showed that almost half the local people were in favour of the jet and support the airport. Less than a third regard it unfavourably. Now, European trade barriers come down in 1992, and the whole of London could benefit if this airport thrives. Not unnaturally, though, it will be local views that may weigh most heavily with the inquiry. The nearby London borough of Redbridge, 10 minutes by road, is poised to take advantage of the economic spin-off from the introduction of jets. They want European businessmen using the airport to set up offices and factories in the borough and have produced a video showing their links with it. Access to airports in, in the, the future, they hope businesses may relocate from other areas so they can be close to the airport. They believe this could help create up to 3,000 new jobs. Opening up the exciting prospect of direct flights, city centre to city centre. Many employers in central London... Local supporters of the airport say this will not be at the cost of their quality of life. I mean, those people that are against the airport, uh, I respect their views, but they are, they, they are in the minority, and uh, local protesters are in very, very short supply. When the docks were in full swing, they were certainly noisy. There were noisy cranes, ships hooting in the early hours of the morning as they sailed on the night tide. Uh, ship repairing with riveters working at Harland and Wolf. There was plenty of noise. The difference was that all the people here were involved in it. And the sad thing here at the moment is that we've got this 17% unemployment and not sufficient people are employed in this new industry. I didn't think that it would get off the ground, but as the area was so derelict and we really needed something to boost the area up, I honestly thought that it would be a very good, good opportunity for people. I suppose we could all sit back and say, you know, well, that's it. But when you look around and you see that there are seven out of ten kids can't get a job and all the rest of it, I mean, that's just the kind of things you've got to start looking at. And there is no, there is nobody looking here. There's no one going to come here with a magic wand to get things going. If you look at what the airport provides at the moment, it provides jobs, it provides a new industry. It provides a capability for Docklands and the Docklands community and the City of London to develop. Um, and it adds an, an extra dimension to London and everything concerned with London into, into Europe. All of that could possibly disappear if the airport didn't develop. But for us, as I've said before, the logic of what we're asking for, and really it isn't that much, is so absolute, so straightforward, so caring about the community and everything else, that we don't see this application being turned down. We haven't got a lot of resources, but we've got some. I mean, we're managed. I think the truth and people, the hearts of the people, carries a lot more weight than all their money. You don't need money to get up on that stand and tell the truth. While the public inquiry looks set to last at least six months, the airport will have to continue trying to attract passengers. In the meantime, it'll need to brace itself well for some turbulence ahead.